Well, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Kelsey, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here uh, at McLean Bible Church, and I'm uh, glad that you guys are here. Also, to those of you, of you who are watching online, uh, I'm glad that you guys are tuned in as well. Um, I'm excited to be able to dig into this uh, issue tonight. Uh, one of the tragedies, as I was thinking about this, one of the tragedies of our culture is that there are a lot of moral issues that have really significant implications for how all of us should live, but uh, specifically for how Christians should live. But a lot of those issues have kind of gotten um, bound up in or shrouded by politics. And uh, so in many ways, it's kind of like we've lost the ability to really learn uh, from the scriptures on important issues, issues that really matter to God because uh, our uh, initial kind of knee-jerk interpretation or allegiance is our own political uh, persuasion. And so uh, we wanted to talk about this issue tonight. And if you're here or you're watching and you're not a Christian, it's important to understand that for us as believers in Jesus, uh, we really do believe that first and foremost, everything in our life should be shaped uh, primarily by Scripture, by the Bible. And so as a pastor, I felt compelled to help us kind of think through uh, this issue uh, biblically and practically, uh, really because in the midst of the public debate, uh, there are real, uh, live, displaced people in dire circumstances um, uh, that need help. And, uh, and so, uh, and many of them are showing up right here in our community uh, every month, not to mention those that are resettled all around the world. And so uh, I've, I've had the privilege of sharing meals and doing ministry uh, with refugee families here in Montgomery County. Uh, those of you who are part of our church, you know recently we have been uh, serving um, Iraqi refugees uh, by providing mobile clinics and other resources. Um, and so the questions that I've been wrestling with personally as a Christian and as a pastor are how do we obey Jesus' command to love our neighbor as ourself? And then what does all of this, how does all of this relate to Jesus' command to bring the gospel to people of all nations. In other words, how does Jesus want us to engage not just the policies, but the people themselves? That's what's really been driving me. And so tonight, I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to welcome uh, our friends at World Relief, who are faithfully working to equip and mobilize the church to love refugees well. Uh, Jenny Yang is the Vice President of Advocacy and Policy for World Relief. Uh, she's worked in the resettlement section of World Relief as the Senior Case Manager in East Asia program officer, and uh, she's done a bunch of stuff. Uh, she's the co-author of Welcoming the Stranger, Justice, Compassion, and Truth in the Immigration Debate, and serves as chair of the Refugee Council USA Africa Work Group. And then Matthew Sorens, who actually just released uh, um, and co-authored a book that, that was released this week, is the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization for World Relief, previously served as the field director for the Evangelical Immigration Table. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the book that was just released this week, which you'll be able to pick up tonight, is Seeking Refuge on the Shores of the Global Refugee Crisis. I also co-author of Welcoming the Stranger with Jenny Yang, and I've read Seeking Refuge. Uh, it's been a huge help uh, for me even this week. And then James Meisner, uh, I kind of don't even want to read his bio. He's a personal friend. I just kind of want to make fun of him is what I really want to do. But uh, he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great guy. He was on staff uh, with us at McLean Bible Church. Uh, known that guy since college, been a really uh, close friend to me and my family, uh, but he uh, has since moved on and is the vice president of church partnership for World Relief and just leads teams in the U.S. Uh, around the world um, uh, to deepen and expand cross-cultural partnerships. And so he's been on pastoral staff here at our church at Wheaton uh, Bible Church, uh, and I'm uh, just excited to have the three of them here to be able to share uh, with us. And so each of them is going to share tonight, uh, and then we'll end with a time of Q&A. And so if you have uh, questions throughout the night, we're going to keep the Q&A uh, towards the end. You can text the number uh, that's, that's going to pop up on the screen throughout the night if you have questions, and then we'll go through them at the end. Or if, you, uh, if your text minutes are tight this month, uh, then you can, uh, you can go old-fashioned. We have index cards in the back. Uh, at the table there, and you can just uh, keep track of your questions on those cards, and then we'll hand them in at the end of the night. So if you're watching online, you can feel free to use that text number as well. We'll get the qu uh, questions, um, uh, uh, and then we'll be able to ask them uh, to our guests at the end of the night. So let me pray for us uh, before we dig in here. Uh, Father, your word tells us that the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. 
He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And Father, as I've meditated on those verses today, I have been so thankful that uh, you are this kind of God, a God who is full of compassion and full of mercy, a God who executes justice. And Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom today, Father, uh, to know how to reflect your heart uh, for the world uh, as it relates to this particular issue, to these particular people who are suffering all around the world. So speak uh, to us uh, tonight, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd had enough of the injustice. I wanted to save my son and daughter, but where did I get the strength to leave? I don't know. I didn't expect us to make it. We stayed at the border for four days, sleeping outside in the rain. What little food I had, I gave to my children. Back home in Syria, their school was hit by an airstrike. Our home had been destroyed by rockets. I just wanted to give them a safe, stable life in another country. We serve Iraqi refugees, Syrian refugees, and not all of them living in camps. Some of them choose to be out of the camp because camps, it's not freedom. Most of the families, they have from five to 20 kids. They are living in one room, all of them. They need food, medicine, health care. They're struggling to finish their education. If they don't go to school, it will be very hard for them to survive. If these kids, they were raised on streets with bitterness, with bad memory, what future we will have? In Syria, I was a lab technician. But here, I had to learn sewing because it was the only way I could provide for my children. Our future will be difficult. We don't have anyone here. The only real family we found was the church. This church has hope for many people in this environment. When they are sick, they are coming to the church. When they are in need, they are coming to the church. We are trying to serve more than 1,000 kids. Most of them, they are not Christian background. The hard part with the kids, you cannot see fast story, you need time. We invest in their life and we see the different after three, four, five years. When we start our ministry with refugees, they start to ask, why, why you help us? Why you support, why you love us? I believe a lot of people, they are you know, outside without hope, without love, without care. Uh, to invest in this kind of people, it's great investment. They are the present and the future. And if we invest in their life, we will see a good future. The church gave us the most help in the way they care for us, in their love for us. They gave us food. They gave my children clothes, and now they are able to get an education. It's become impossible for us not to go to church because they have become our family. Today I met some kids. I asked them, what's the good thing you see today? They said, Jesus. I said, how? They said, the story of Jesus today touch our heart. When I look at this generation, I see them, we call them the Joshua generation. They are the generation that they will live all the promises. God has given this generation an opportunity to know him. And actually, the real opportunity is for the church. When Jesus died on the cross, not just to come to the church and worship God Sunday and back to our normal life. We are here to show the real love for those that are in need. 
and this is my hope. If the church raise a new generation with a message, with a hope, with love, I believe this is our time to restore the Middle East. It is fantastic to be back with you all at McLean Bible Church. Um, being around here this evening, uh, being able to run into friends, to colleagues that I worked with a number of years ago, uh, has this really been fun, and it's reminded me how important memories are. Memories are really important to us. They shape who we are. Americans every year spend billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, going to see professionals to deal with our memories, past memories. If you talk to somebody maybe in my grandparents' generation, they'll tell you memories that are important in their lives. They'll tell you exactly where they were when they found out that President Kennedy was killed. They'll tell you exactly where they were when they found out that Dr. King was killed. Most of us in this room can tell you exactly where we were when we watched the planes fly into the towers on 9-11. I can tell you where I was, what I was wearing, and even what I ate for dinner that night. A few weeks ago, I was getting my car from the parking garage, and it happened to be the day that Prince died. And as I was waiting to pay my ticket, the conversations around me as people left their offices and were talking to coworkers and colleagues were around where they were when Michael Jackson passed away in Whitney Houston. We remember these types of things. There is one thing that I will absolutely never forget. Uh, it happened this past August. My wife and I had just had our first baby. I was back to work. Uh, from paternity leave, and I was hosting my staff from around the country, uh, right up the street from here in Baltimore. And uh, in a nondescript hotel meeting space, all of a sudden, my phone starts going crazy in my pocket, beeping, buzzing, vibrating, to the point where I had to say, hey, we need to stop this meeting right now, something's happened. I pulled up my phone, and pretty much every text message was the same. Have you seen the picture? Have you seen the picture? Have you seen the picture? Um, it was a picture of Alan Kurdi washed up on the beach uh, in Turkey with his little bottom up in the air like children around the world sleep. Uh, it went viral, and uh, most of us were devastated uh, by that picture. We saw our own children uh, in that picture, and this was particularly devastating for me, not only because I had just had a child, but I've spent the past 10 years working with refugees in various forms, whether in my personal life or in my professional life, and I've actually spent the past few years working specifically on the Syrian refugee crisis. I went home that night and I said, I don't want to look at this picture anymore. I don't want to look at this little boy washed up on the beach. I don't want to have to deal with this. And I remember exactly where I was sitting in my house, in a chair in my living room, with my daughter on my chest, and I said, God, I actually have to look at this picture. Something is desperately wrong that little boys like this and hundreds of others are washing up on beaches around the world. And we have to deal with this. So I sat there holding my daughter on my chest, looking at this picture. But the most disturbing part of this was I had to ask myself two questions. First, I had to ask myself, James, how horrific would the situation have to be for you to put her in a boat like his dad put him in a boat and set out to a place that you didn't know? What type of hell would you have had to come from to set out not knowing where you were going with the most precious thing in your entire life? The second question I had to ask myself was, what am I going to do about this? I had spent years working on this. It was my job, but this changed something for me. This changed something for lots of us at World Relief. We had to do something different. And I think that these are the questions that we have to answer. You see, all of us in the moment can respond uh, to a refugee wow. crisis. When it's on the headlines of CNN and the New York Times, we can all respond to it. Uh, but what's much harder is learning how to continue that engagement for years and years and years and years because those headlines fade. On average, a child displaced today in the world, whether it's from the Middle East, Africa, or Asia, on average, it takes them 17 years to find a permanent home. A child born the day that Alan Kurdi washed up on the beach in Turkey would be a junior or senior in high school before they found a permanent home. My daughter would have been a junior or senior in high school before they found a permanent home. 
what am I going to do about this? I need to figure out how to sustain that journey for multiple years because this is a multiple year crisis. Another question we have to ask about our engagement is with all the rhetoric around right now about Muslims and people from the Middle East being our enemy, it's hard to, sus it's hard to imagine sustaining anything for the long term without answering the question as to why should we be doing this in the first place. You don't have to go far from Facebook or Twitter to the news to find people saying that all Muslims are terrorists. As a church, we need to answer that question if we're going to engage in the refugee crisis. Another thing we can't ignore is that if we believe the church is the answer to the refugee crisis, we have to attend to the fact that the church in the Middle East has undergone 100 years of intense persecution. 100 years ago, many countries in the Middle East had populations that were 20% followers of Jesus, and today it's 2, 3, 4, 5%, depending on the country. If we're going to do something about the refugee crisis, we need to attend to all of these things, but we need to find something deeper to root our response in, and I think that we need to find that rooted in the gospel. You see, the basics of the gospel are quite simple. It's that God uh, in Christ saw that we were living in a mess. We were living in our own state of a decay and filth, and the message version of the Bible says that he chose to move into our neighborhood. He knew that he would come and be ridiculed, despised, and rejected, that he would be persecuted. He knew that he wouldn't be welcomed, but the amazing thing about the gospel is he said that even though I'm going to move down there and they're going to be enemies of the cross that I'm going to bear, I'm going to do it anyway. The most basic and profound truth of the gospel is what the scriptures say is this, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for their friends. If we're going to respond to the refugee crisis, our answer to the question of why needs to be the answer of love. That in the face of a crisis, more people displaced today than any other point in time in human history, 65 million people, that in the face of a crisis, knowing that we might be rejected, knowing that we might be scorned, that we would willingly choose to make ourselves nothing, that we would be obedient, that we would be humble, that we would be servants to answer the call of God on our lives. Uh, last year, uh, my wife and I were living in Baltimore when the protests and riots uh, um, happened uh, in our city. And after that uh, took place, lots of churches in the city and in surrounding areas decided, hey, we need to do something about this. We need to roll up our sleeves. But I heard lots of people saying something along these lines. We, we're going to go start going to a different church because we are more, quote unquote, discipleship people. What they really meant is they wanted to go and get themselves into a nice space and dive into a study of Ephesians, which I think is a great thing to do, uh, but they didn't want to roll up their sleeves and dive into an issue that was affecting the city. Well, my question is, what is discipleship? And we need to ask that question with the refugee crisis. Are we just going to go and do a nice study, or are we going to actually engage? I think that discipleship looks like love, that when we love lost people because we love God, we experience the richest form of discipleship. When we love lost people, when we love people who are different from us, we experience the richest, most deep form of discipleship. When we love lost people, not because of our own compassion, not because of the guilt that pictures like that make us feel, but when we love them because God first loved us, we experience radical transformation. You see, love calls forth the image of God, whether they are Christian, whether they are Jewish, or whether they're Muslim. Love looks out for the interest of others before it looks out for its own interests. Love is designed for our enemies, and it's designed for those who persecute us. The scriptures say that love bears all things, it believes all things, and that it endures all things. Love is how the world will know that we're his disciples. Love is the very expression of the church. It's our job as the church. We're designed to love lost people. We're designed to love people who are different from us. If loving lost people because we love God is the richest form of discipleship, then we must understand that we have to love all lost people, even if they make us afraid, or even if we fear a, a tingling of prejudice against them. We still have to love them. The refugee crisis presents the church one of the greatest opportunities in human history to love lost people. Christian missionaries have been trying to serve in these areas of the Middle East for decades, and now people from those regions are coming to them in Europe and in North America. The church is the only thing that can solve the refugee crisis, both here and there. 
Uh, some quick stories. Uh, actually, when I was working uh, here at McLean Bible Church, uh, we partnered with World Relief in Burundi and also worked to resettle Burundian refugees uh, here in Maryland. Uh, there was um, a couple. Their names were Hosea and Agnes. And I got the chance to meet Hosea and Agnes along with some friends from McLean the day they arrived in the U.S. Uh, they were resettled right down the street in Silver Spring. Um, and Hosea and Agnes, even though they were Burundian refugees, had actually never been to Burundi. That stat I shared about taking 17 years on average, uh, it's longer for some people. Hosea and Agnes's mom and dad, uh, moms and dad, uh, were refugees from Burundi. They moved to Tanzania where they lived, fell in love, got married in a refugee camp, and Hosea and Agnes were born in a refugee camp. They, likewise, fell in love and got married in that refugee camp and had uh, two beautiful little girls. Uh, had never uh, been on a plane, had never had running water or electricity, and that first night in their apartment, just a few miles from here, we spent a whole lot of time doing something very simple. Teaching them that a switch on the wall, when you flick it up and down, controls the lights overhead. They had never had electricity, they couldn't figure out, they couldn't comprehend it, they didn't have a place in their brain to store that information because they had never experienced it before. The next day, what we learned how to do was how to use a flush toilet. If you've lived in a refugee camp your entire life, you don't sit down to go to the bathroom, you squat. And so they were breaking their toilet because they were standing on it, squatting, trying to go to the bathroom. That was a really interesting afternoon in my life. They were afraid that their two little girls were going to get sucked down the bathroom uh, bathtub drain. I had never had indoor running water before. One day I went over uh, on my way to the office and their gas stove was on, just running with nothing on top of it. So I asked, why didn't you turn that off? Like, why is it still going? And their answer was, well, it will, it will go out. If you've cooked on charcoal your entire life, when it's finished, it goes out. Um, Amazingly uh, wonderful transformational process in my own life to work with Jose and Agnes. Uh, several years later, um, some friends of my wife and I's in Chicago, where we lived at the time, uh, had become friends of two Iraqi uh, refugees. Uh, the husband had served with the U.S. military in Iraq, uh, and they were granted refugee status. And you know, over a period of time, we became friends. Uh, it was during Ramadan, and they asked if they could break fast at our house which we thought was a great thing to do. And they asked because we lived in a high rise uh, and Chicagoland is flat and they could see the sunset every night from our balcony. So they asked if they could come over. It was June and so the days were really long and we had all the food in the kitchen and we were sitting out on the balcony and I will admit that I was becoming quite hangry as we were there and I would sneak into the kitchen and uh, get food. Uh, but the sun set, um, we ate dinner and we started a conversation. And we asked the simple question of them, tell us why Muslims fast. It's a great conversation starter, had a really brilliant conversation about it, but then they asked us a really interesting question. They said, uh, why don't Christians fast? Which actually got me thinking that I've never heard a sermon on fasting, let alone a sermon illustration on fasting in my entire adult life. Uh, but we were able to say, hey, that's really interesting because Christians do fast. And actually Jesus, uh, the person that we follow, uh, the scriptures tell us that he fasted in the desert for 40 days and we were able to break out the iPad, pull up the story, and the amazing thing about technology is you hit one button and they can read it in Arabic and you can read it in English and it was an absolutely fantastic conversation. Several months ago, I was in the Middle East and I was in one of the churches like you just saw in the video, a church of uh, 40, 50 people who every single week was serving over 300 refugees from Syria and Iraq a church serving five times the size of its own congregation. I can't even imagine what would happen if churches here served five times our Sunday morning attendance. Uh, and as I was meeting with the pastor, as I was frankly learning more from that pastor than I was able to contribute, uh, he introduced me to this woman and we were sitting on the floor and she told me the story of leaving Syria, of her husband being killed, of losing children along the way, and having purposed in her heart that she was never going to go to a church ever, period, done. Well, her life got so bad that eventually she needed to go to the church. One of her kids got uh, deathly ill and the church down the street was hosting a medical clinic. So she took her, her child there, he became better, and eventually she ended up accepting Christ and we sat there on the floor and she said, I pray the same thing every single day. I pray for lots of things, but there's one thing I pray every single day and I say, God, thank you so much for ISIS. 
It's because of ISIS that I found the church. How amazing is that? What an amazing opportunity for followers of Jesus here and there to make a difference in one of the biggest tragedies of our time. I think those churches in the Middle East have really tapped into something. When I go to churches and I do talks like this, Matt and Jenny have the same experience. There's one thing people always want to do, and we gladly receive it. People want to take an offering for us. But even though we need money, even though lots of organizations need money right now, those churches in the Middle East have tapped into something, and churches across the country are doing it as well, and that is that we can't fully measure discipleship by the checks that we write. We have to measure discipleship by the crosses that we bear. If we love God, we must walk across the street and embrace our Muslim neighbor. If we love God, we must stand with the persecuted church. If we love God, we must work in the Muslim-majority world, serve them, sacrifice for them, and if necessary, suffer alongside of them. Why? Because this is what Jesus would have done. And frankly, this is not the job of world relief. We can do a lot, but we can't do everything. This is the job of the local church the local church here and the local church there. A lot of organizations and a lot of people will come and say that the church is the answer, but what they really mean is that you're the answer to their budget problems. What I mean is that all of us as American Christ followers need to roll up our sleeves and do the messy work of ministry. This is not something that we can hire out. It's not house cleaning, it's not yard service, it's not snow removal. The church, transformed by God's love, seeking to show that love to others, is the only way that we can solve this problem. We can't buy a solution. There are certain things in life that I am absolutely never going to forget. Seeing my children born, my wedding day, they're permanently ingrained in our mind. I will never forget teaching Hosea and Agnes how to use the light switch and the toilet and the gas stove. I will never forget sitting on the balcony taking out the iPad, reading the story of Jesus fasting in the desert. And I will also never forget coming home from work one day, holding my daughter on my chest and looking at the picture of Alan Curdy. I'll never forget pondering those questions, asking what would it take for me to put my kid in the boat, asking what I need to do in response to this. But as time has gone on, I've pondered another question. And that's this, what did God think of my time in that chair? What did God think of my questions? When I was asking the question of what would it take for me to put my kid in the boat, I think God had a very different question. In fact, I think he had a response that I've uh, slowly been trying to discern over these past months. And his response was, I wasn't trying to see how bad something had to, had to be to get my kid out of there. I chose a long time ago to send my kid into the fire because I didn't want any other mom and dad to have to decide that they had to put their kid in a boat. I sent my kid into a war. I sent him to make peace. I sent him to be love. I sent him because there's no one else that could solve the problems that you all face. You see, the essence of our faith is that we must lay down our lives in order to pick them up, in order to be fulfilled. We must humble ourselves to be exalted. This got me thinking about the modern uh, pioneers of missions. Uh, I know that at McLean we hear about them a lot in sermons on Sunday morning. Uh, and you can say what you want about the modern missions pioneers. They made a lot of mistakes, and sometimes we still see the repercussions of that. Uh, but I say for all of that, I think that they were saints. They understood that greater love had no one than this, that he laid down his life for they fr her, their friends. Uh, they put all their belongings in coffins and set out around the world. They knew they were going to pay the ultimate sacrifice to follow the call of God on their lives. And I think the question that we need to ask as the church is if the modern pioneers of missions can put their things into coffins and set out across the world, we need to be able to take a plate of cookies across the street. If they can do that, I think that we need to be able to do something as simple as baking chocolate chip cookies and walking them across the street to someone who is different from us. If we have not allowed God's love to penetrate deep enough into our hearts to carry a plate of cookies across the street, then what's going to propel us across the world? Our love for God compels us to love our neighbor. We don't have any other option. Our politics, our party, and frankly, even our preferences don't matter all that much. If we can't love our neighbor, what type of half-baked version of Christianity are we exporting around the world? How will we answer our brothers and sisters in the Middle East who are facing intense persecution? 
If we can't be inconvenienced by cookies, what will happen when real trials come? What will happen when we face suffering instead of just mere inconvenience? If the, middle, if the decline of the church in the Middle East is because of persecution, I would argue that the decline of the church in North America is because of apathy. I think that it can be reversed both there and here by the church rolling up their sleeves and doing work, but the reality is that work won't be easy and the call of God on our lives never is. We will face, and the church in the Middle East is already facing troubles and hardship and persecution, but the scriptures say that not death or life or angels or demon or things present or things in the future or powers and principalities, and I don't think I could even articulate to you what powers and principalities are, but I know they're a whole heck of a lot more scary than ISIS. The scriptures tell us that none of those things can separate us from the love of God. We're told, church, that we were not given a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love. The book of Lamentations reminds us that because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. And church, there's lots to lament in our world today, from the racial injustice being perpetrated in cities across the United States to a refugee crisis in the Middle East and in Africa. But because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. His mercies are new to us every morning. May we receive those mercies, and we may, may we extend them to people who are lost and who are different from us around the world. Uh, my colleague Matt is going to come uh, and talk more about what the scriptures specifically say about refugees. Uh, Matt, come on up. Thank you. Well, as James said, one of our core convictions at World Relief is that the church all over the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, is to be at the center of the global refugee crisis. But you know, we've been working with refugees for decades at World Relief, both internationally and in the United States. We're one of nine agencies nationally that is authorized by the US State Department to help resettle refugees here in the US. But six or seven months ago, when that image that James mentioned went all over the world, and then when there was terrorist attacks in Paris, suddenly refugees became very controversial in a way that in the 10 years that I've been at World Relief, they never have been. So we actually commissioned some research because we were wondering, how are churches feeling about this? So we went to Lifeway Research, which is a Christian polling firm, and basically asked them, can you poll Protestant pastors in the United States and get their views on this issue of refugees? Uh, and we found some interesting things. The first thing we found, which I found encouraging, is that 86% of Protestant pastors in the US affirm that as Christians, we should care sacrificially for refugees and foreigners. I'd like to push that up to 100, but that's, you know, that was pretty encouraging. But the, the, the rest of the findings were less encouraging. So 86% said we should care. 8% said they were, their church was currently involved in serving refugees locally. Uh, less than one in five said they were currently involved in serving refugees overseas in some way through supporting uh, organizations like World Relief or missionaries or whatever. 44% uh, of pastors said that there was a sense of fear about refugees in their congregations. And then we also, uh, about a year earlier, actually surveyed uh, not just pastors, but all evangelical Christians. And I think this goes to some of the dynamics that that we're looking at, 57% of, of evangelical Christians and 69% of white evangelicals, which is my category, said that the arrival of immigrants to their community presents a threat or a burden of some sort. Meanwhile, only 42% said that the arrival of refugees or other immigrants presented an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. Now, this was one of those surveys where you could check all that applies. So even if you think that, you know, refugees are bad for the economy or that sort of thing, you still could have said, but this is an opportunity for me to introduce them to Jesus. But most evangelical Christians don't have that perspective. And I think what's happening is it's much easier, if we've accepted a narrative that this is a threat, this is something to be afraid of, it's very difficult to see an opportunity. An opportunity that I believe very strongly is something that God has, has, has really blessed our country with. And this is the last stat that I found troubling 12% of evangelical Christians in the United States say that their views on refugees and other immigrants are primarily influenced by the Bible. Now, as evangelical Christians, we would say that the Bible is our authority for 
any tough issue. But when it comes to this issue, and the views of national Christian leaders combined came in lower than the media, by our own admission, which I find rather troubling. But, and I find that particularly troubling because this is not a topic that the Bible has nothing to say on. First of all, if you think about it, we gather on Sunday mornings to worship a refugee. Jesus was a Middle Eastern refugee fleeing a tyrannical government. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read what many of us would think of as the Christmas story. In fact, last Christmas, my three-year-old daughter, now three-year-old daughter, Zipporah, noticed in our nativity scene that there was no Herod figurine. Do your nativity scenes have Herods? I've not seen a nativity scene with a Herod. He doesn't tend to make the Christmas pageant. Um, we get to the wise men, and that's like, nice, happy ending. You know, turn off the story there. But that's not the end of the story. In Matthew chapter 2, as the wise men are leaving, Herod's on his way. And Joseph is warned in a dream that he needs to get up in the middle of the night and take Mary and Jesus and go to Egypt. And the scriptures don't really tell us much about what their experience was when they got there. We don't know if they were welcomed when they got there. That's certainly, even to this day, part of the culture of the Middle East is one of hospitality. But it's also quite possible that there was others who didn't want them there, who might have said, you know what, Joseph? We've got enough carpenters in this economy without you stealing a job. Or we don't know what kind of diseases this kid has. Um, we don't know, we can only guess. But that was part of our Lord's experience as a human being. I think another biblical concept that's really important to start out as we think about this topic of refugees is just the, the biblical principle that every single human being, refugees included, is made in the image of God. We find that in, in the book of Genesis. That means that every single person has inherent dignity. And because they are made in the image of the creator God, has incredible potential. I cringe whenever I hear people talking about refugees as a burden. Because people made in God's image are not a burden. We sometimes talk, well, how many jobs will these refugees take? And we forget to ask the question of how many jobs might they create? Have any of you ever heard of Sergi Brin? Sergi Brin was a refugee, um, came as a small child, um, fleeing anti-Semitic persecution in the Soviet Union, resettled. Um, as a refugee and eventually went on to start a small business. That small business became a big business. It's now, in some, by some measures, the biggest business. It's called Google. Most of you have probably used it in the last half hour. Um, and not only a service that many of us appreciate, uh, it's also, you know, has employed many, many people. And that's the creative potential of a refugee. Another theme in the scriptures is the command to love our neighbors. And we find that in the New Testament, um, a couple different places in the gospel, but most notably in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus is asked by a lawyer, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says it is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer, who the scriptures tell us wants to justify himself, he says, well, who is my neighbor? And you get the sense that he's looking for an answer that's something like, well, your neighbor's the person you know, three doors down on either side who is of the same skin color and religion as you. But that's not the response that Jesus gives. Jesus tells the story that we know of as the Good Samaritan. The story of this man who, we presume a Jewish man who's on the road down to Jericho, who's beaten up, left to die. And a priest and a Levite, the religious leaders of the day, walk on by on the other side. But a Samaritan, someone from a different ethnic group, someone from a different religion, someone, frankly, who had some theological beliefs that were off. He's the person who stops, who sees this man, who has compassion on him. And stopping in what is probably a pretty dangerous place to stop on this road to Jericho, and at significant expense to himself, helps him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And I think it's a very obvious ramification of that, that our neighbor, whom we're called to love, is pretty much anyone who's in need. Regardless of their religion, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of anything else that we might have in common or that might be, make them different from us. Regardless of if, if it's scary, regardless, regardless if it's convenient, regardless of it's costly. The interesting thing is, uh, if this was a good lawyer, he would have known 
that when Jesus said to love your neighbor, uh, that go, we, we find that for the first time in, in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 19. It's the first time that the scriptures record the command to love your neighbor. Leviticus 19, verse 18. And then just a few verses later, we find the specific command to love the foreigner. Going all the way back to the Old Testament, God had very clear instructions to his people, almost as if anticipating that question of, well, when you said you love your neighbor, you didn't mean those people, did you? Jesus, God says to the Israelites, when the foreigners reside with you in your land, you shall not mistreat them. The foreigners residing among you shall be to you as your native born. You shall love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. Uh, another theme that I think is important, and James alluded to this as well, is as we welcome refugees, we have the opportunity to stand with the persecuted church. One thing that I think has gotten lost in a lot of the media coverage of the refugees' situation right now, especially in terms of refugees coming to the United States, is you might presume from the media coverage that all refugees were Muslim. There are some refugees who are Muslim. The majority coming from Syria are. But most refugees coming into the United States are not coming from Syria. In fact, last year, more came from Burma than from anywhere else. And 80% of those coming from Burma were ethnic minorities who are largely Baptist or Anglican Christians. And that is the reason that they've been forced to flee their country. Uh, in fact, if you look overall in the last 10 years, there's been more Christians resettled as refugees to the United States than those of any other religious tradition. And I think, I think of, you know, if I were in their shoes, if I were forced to flee my home with my wife and my kids and go to some other country, and I got to some other border or some other airport somewhere, I would hope that there would be someone from the church there to meet me at the airport, help me figure out where I went next, to lament with me all that was lost, and to help me rebuild my life. And I want to be able to be those people for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted, uh, who are coming to our country. The flip side of that, of course, is there are many coming, um, a minority, but a significant number, who are Muslims, or others who are Hindu, or are other religious traditions. And we have the opportunity, as we love and welcome them, because they are our neighbors, because they are made in the image of God, to also point them to Jesus. Uh, we get that question that, that we heard in the video earlier that churches in the Middle East are hearing quite often. So, you all are from a church. Why are you doing this? Why are you welcoming us? Why are you helping us figure out the grocery store and our medical bills and the, you know, the cell phone package? Why are, you these, why are you being so kind to us? And we get to tell people it's because we're followers of Jesus and he commands us to love our neighbors. And we get questions all the time. We have the opportunity, as 1 Peter 3 says, to give an answer to those who ask for the, the reason for the hope that is within us. I believe that in the movement of people, there is a God-ordained plan for us to be able to live out the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations, right in our own communities. And we've seen that happen. Never coercively, where we serve people regardless of their faith background, and there's no preconditions for us to serve them at World Relief. But people are curious because they've been welcomed in by the local churches that we partner with, and we get to point them to Jesus. There's a quote here um, from Al Mohler, who's the uh, president down at Southern Baptist Seminary in Kentucky. He says, for the first time in American history, this immigration wave is touching not just the coast and not just the major cities, but much smaller areas as well. Right here in the United States, right in our own towns, we've never faced such a great commission responsibility. We have never faced such a great commission opportunity. Sorry. Um, here's the reality, though. We can't presume that just because people from a Christian background or from a non-Christian background move into a country where most people are Christians, that they will necessarily encounter Jesus. Uh, a study out of Gordon-Conwell Seminary found that 60% of people from non-Christian religious traditions in North America, those are mostly refugees and other immigrants, 60% said they do not know a Christian. Not that they've never been to church or never read the Bible or never heard the gospel, but they don't actually know a Christian. And that might sound a little bit surprising, because look, there's a lot of Christians in this country, right? But then if you consider the fact that only about one in four white evangelical Christians say that they uh, know a person who, personally who's a Muslim, and even a smaller percentage who know a Hindu or a Buddhist, it kind of makes sense. Because a lot of people come here and are relatively isolated. But the church has the opportunity to go into those neighborhoods, to love those people as our neighbors, to get to know them, and in the process to point people to Jesus. 
J.D. Payne, who's a pastor down in Alabama, says that something is missionally malignant whenever we're willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group, but are not willing to walk across the street. I think this goes to Jesus' teaching, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I'll close uh, with, sorry, with one, one last biblical principle, and that's the idea of hospitality. Um, I grew up, I think, with a misunderstanding of hospitality. Like, that's, that's a good church word. You probably have, like, a hospitality committee around here. Uh, it's, hospitality is an industry, right? Like, there's hotels and restaurants. Uh, but usually when we talk about hospitality, it's often in the context of saying something like having your friends over for lunch. You know, my, my wife and I had some friends over for a meal recently, and on their way out the door, they said, thanks so much for hospitality. Here's the problem. Hospitality in, in the Greek of the New Testament is philoxenia. It is literally the love of strangers. So to paraphrase Jesus, you love your friends, big deal. Everybody loves their friends. That's basically the definition of a friend. Um, What Christ calls us to is beyond that, to love those who are different from us, who are unknown to us. And I don't want to pretend that that is normal in this country. I mean, I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons that were all about stranger danger. Strangers are people to be afraid of. We hunch up our shoulders and think, this is a potential threat to me. Now, I'm not going to tell you the scripture promises those people are not a threat to you. Although Jenny will go over this, there's plenty of good reasons not to be afraid if you look at the actual facts. But um, we are commanded very, very clearly to welcome strangers. Romans chapter 12, when it tells us to practice hospitality, you can literally read that, practice loving strangers. And I'll close with this story. In in Hebrews chapter 13, it tells us that by welcoming strangers, some people have entertained angels without realizing it. A few years back, uh, there was a new family moved into our apartment complex where my wife and I lived. We'd just gotten married. Um, They were from East Africa. They came actually on temporary visas and eventually applied for asylum. They were fleeing a dangerous situation in their country. And we realized pretty quickly that because they didn't come in through the refugee resettlement program, they didn't have all the support that refugees do, they had almost nothing in their apartment. Um, So we put a a message up on Facebook, and some people from our church brought some furniture. Um, It was a a mom, two kids, and the mom was eight months pregnant. So my wife was actually there with her at the hospital. It's a month after she arrived, um, when that newborn baby was born. Uh, I got to um, help you know, have one of their sons in a Bible study that I was leading, and about a year later, watch him be baptized at our church. Um, so they needed some help up front, but over time, they didn't need as much help. They just became friends. Um, they got their asylum approved, they got jobs, they started working. And after about two years, their hu- the, the, the father and husband in the family was able to be reunited to them. And I was there at O'Hare Airport, in, like, bawling more than anyone else, as he met his two-year-old daughter for the first time. Well, over time, um, that couple just became good friends to me and my wife, and at a certain point, we were over, uh, they were over at our house for dinner. And, you know, this is a cultural difference between the U.S. and, and Africa. They asked us quite directly, so, you guys have been married for a while, when are you going to have kids? And Diana and I kind of looked at each other, and the reality was we'd been, have, we'd been hoping and praying and trying to have kids for more than a year, and it wasn't happening. And so, we just kind of sheepishly explain that, you know, we'd love to have kids, but just not something that has happened so far. And, and our friend turned to us and he said, you know, I just have this sense from the Lord that within a year, God's going to bless you with a child. I kind of sheepishly smiled because I've been disappointed before. We're of a slightly different theological tradition than them, and I, I didn't know quite what to do with that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was only a few months later that we were back at their house for dinner, and this time we got to tell them that we were expecting a baby. And I remember there's, there's sort of a delay because English is not their first language. And, but the moment they realized what we were telling them, they fell down on the ground prostrate with lots of yesus and hallelujahs, praising God. And they went on to tell us that they had been getting up early every Thursday and fasting all day and praying that God would bless us with a child. And I, that picture is my daughter, Zipporah, with her very special friends, And she is, I have no doubt, an answer to their prayers. And to ours, but mostly to theirs. (laughs) Because I wasn't fasting much for myself. Um, And frankly, we have so much to learn from brothers and sisters who have undergone incredible persecution and have learned to rely upon prayer. So I want to leave you with that challenge to welcome strangers and to not be surprised if a few of them turn out to be angels. 
And with that, I want to introduce my colleague, Jenny, because it's great to know what the Bible says about this. I think we should start there. I actually think that should be enough, but it's usually not, because a lot of people have a lot of other questions about, well, what about terrorism? What about some of the demographic questions and the economics and all those dynamics? So Jenny's going to give us some of the facts on this issue. So when we talk about refugees, it's actually very deeply personal to me. Um, my father was uh, born in South Korea at a time when South Korea was um, war-torn. And in fact, he remembers when um, some soldiers came to his door when he was a very young child, and they were looking for his father, my grandfather. And they were looking for my grandfather because he was a journalist at the time, and the media were the first uh, people groups um, or occupations that they were actually targeting. Um, and so my father remembers um, soldiers banging down the door when he was about three years old um, and looking for my grandfather, and they uh, found my grandfather upstairs in the house. They pulled him out in the middle of the night, and my father never saw him again. Um, so my father ended up living uh, with his mother, and for the next several years, they were doing okay, but then his mom got suddenly sick. And so his mom passed away when he was seven years old, and so he became an orphan overnight. Now, in South Korea at that time, it was racked by war, it was racked by conflict. My grandfather was persecuted because he was a journalist, um, and he was eventually killed by the soldiers. Um, and so my father always had this dream that he was gonna move out of South Korea because he felt like he was completely defined by poverty. If he didn't have parents, if he was a poor, how was he gonna make it in a country where um, you, you couldn't get an education if you didn't have the money to afford it? And so he always dreamed of coming here to this country, to the United States of America, where he, could, he felt like he wasn't going to be defined by poverty. Um, and so he became really good at fixing cars, entered a national car repair competition, won first place, and eventually was able to immigrate to um, the United States through um, a visa at the Ford Motor Company. Um, and so he ended up settling in Philadelphia. And so whenever uh, people traverse through Philly, I always tell them, if your car ever breaks down, you know who to call because my dad is the best mechanic in the city. Um, so when I talk about my dad, I realize um, he actually um, was a Christian because there are mis American missionaries who went to Korea at that time um, and shared the gospel with my grandmother. And before she passed away from her sickness, um, she passed on the faith um, of Jesus Christ to my dad. And it was his story and his faith that really um, fueled my family's own story living here in the United States of America. But when you hear about the story of my father, um, my father's story is not necessarily unique um, in that there are millions of people today who are fleeing persecution, who are fleeing conflict and poverty and settling into another place. In fact, um, just a few weeks ago, the United Nations um, released a report in which they found that for the first time in recorded history, the number of people who are being forced to flee their homes has surpassed 60 million individuals. Um, this is the most number of people displaced since World War II, um, which means that um, for every, uh, um, every day, there's thousands of people who are fleeing their homes. And suddenly, the refugee crisis has hit home to us because we realize that this is something that's unprecedented. And we're suddenly starting to ask the questions, well, what does this mean for us? And what does this mean for us as a community? Um, the reason why we're seeing the largest number of displaced around the world is really because of one area of the world in which I want to focus a little bit of time on, which is what's happening in Syria right now. Syria used to be a country that was pretty wealthy. Um, they had a lot of um, high levels of, uh, of education among the populace there. Um, and it was actually the second largest refugee hosting country in the world. In fact, um, when Palestinians were fleeing war and when Iraqi, uh, Iraqi refugees were fleeing war, they actually fled into Syria. And so Syria, um, several years ago, was actually hosting the second largest number of refugees in the world. But within the span of a few years, they have turned into the country that's producing the largest number of refugees in the world. In fact, there are four million refugees from Syria alone, and they're actually settling into places like Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey right now. In fact, in Lebanon, a small country made up of about four million individuals, a quarter of their entire population is made up of refugees. That's like if the entire population of Canada and Mexico were to come into the United States within a span of five years, that's exactly what Lebanon is going through right now. 
Now, we talk about the millions of Syrian refugees, but the Washington Post actually did an article in which they traveled to Turkey and to Jordan to interview some of these refugees, and these are two of the individuals that they interviewed. The first person I want to talk about is Huda Kalaf. She's a 34-year-old Syrian woman um, who's, was, uh, whose husband uh, actually said that he wanted to go out into the war and fight. She remembers pleading with her husband, do not go out and fight because I know I'm going I'm to lose you. Um, and she also had four kids to take care of. And so she desperately pleaded with her husband, do not go out and fight. But he told her, I don't want um, Assad to, to kill off my family and I want to redeem my country back um, to what I believe it should be. And so he went out in the middle of the night and literally the next day he, a bullet was shot through his heart and he passed away. So she became an orphan or her kids became orphans she became a widow and she became poor suddenly in, the, in, one, in one day's time. And so within that time frame, she basically fits into every single category of vulnerability that we see mentioned in the Bible. Um, we also see um, the story of Abdul Rahman. He was 104 years old. He looks like he's 70 years old in this picture. But can you imagine living 100 years in the country of Syria? Um, he talks about how, always, how he was a farmer raising chickpeas and lentils um, and watermelon on his farm. He said he hasn't had teeth in 42 years because his wife kissed him out with all of her kisses. Um, and so he has dozens of grandchildren, and he lived his entire life in a place he called home in Syria. And in the last years of his life, um, he's going to um, end up probably passing away in a land he's never called home, um, living in a 16 by 20 foot tent in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Jordan, where he has ended up. Now, this is something that um, we hear about in the news, but I feel like this is something that we as Americans and we in the West have suddenly started paying attention to because we started realizing that the refugee crisis that was affecting places in the Middle East and places in Africa and places in Asia is suddenly perhaps going to be affecting us in the West. When we saw the picture of Alan Kurdi washed up on the shores of Turkey, and we're also seeing that lots of refugees are actually coming into the United States, we're starting to ask the questions, well, this is not something that's all about the conflict over there, but how is this going to affect me here in the United States? And we in the West have turned the refugee crisis not from, about, uh, not from individuals who have lost their homes and gone through tremendous persecution, but we've suddenly turned the crisis into a crisis about ourselves into a crisis about our comfort, into a crisis about our own security. Um, and there's a couple of things that I want to talk about the process of how refugees can come into this country that I think is really important for us to understand. First, for the millions of refugees that are overseas right now, you cannot choose to be resettled to another country like the United States. What the United Nations actually does is they look at the millions of refugees that have registered and they actually start to understand who are the individuals who are the most vulnerable, who are the individuals who actually cannot return home. And once they identify those individuals, they start referring them to countries like the United States. Um, over the past five years, we've resettled almost 70,000 refugees into this country. Um, and most of the refugees are actually not coming from the e Middle East. They're coming from countries like East Asia and Africa and places that have seen conflict for even longer periods than Syria has experienced. Um, and so what we've seen at World Relief is it's really through the resettlement of refugees. It is really through um, the way that refugees have transformed our communities that we're seeing changes um, across the country. And we often think about refugees coming into this country as transforming the face of our communities. But in fact, we believe that refugees are changing the face of Christianity. And the reason we say this is because it is through immigrants and through refugees coming into our communities that we're seeing revival within our churches and we're seeing Americans understand what God is doing through their migration of people. Uh, we have a church in Nashville that welcomed um, several numbers of Bhutanese refugees um, who are traditionally Buddhist in their communities and were coming into the United States after surf, uh, suffering mass discrimination um, and oppression back in Bhutan. Um, and there was a small church in Nashville that said, I want to be the first to actually welcome the Bhutanese refugees that are coming to my community. Um, they picked up these Bhutanese refugees at the airport. They provided them with housing and befriended them. And when they showed them a Jesus video over one weekend, dozens of these Bhutanese refugees actually came to Christ. And within the month, 70 uh, Bhutanese refugees were actually baptized in a church service. 
Now, many of these refugees became even more evangelical than their American counterparts, and they basically told their volunteers, they said, look, we don't want you to pick us, our, our friends coming from Bhutan at the airport anymore. We're going to do that ourselves. And so they would literally go to the, ref the airport, pick up their Bhutanese friends, and show them the Jesus video as soon as they got into their homes. Now, this is something where they are uh, inspired by the gospel, and they're really living it out and how they're welcoming their, their Bhutanese friends. What we know through the stories of these Bhutanese individuals and of this church in Nashville and churches all across the country is that security doesn't have to come at the expense of compassion. In fact, what we've seen through the arrival of refugees is that re refugees are transforming the life of the church, but it's only when we as followers of Christ can come outside of the confines of our security lens and the ways that we um, want to live comfortable lives to really understand that befriending refugees and befriending immigrants in our communities um, can actually help us understand the transformative work of the gospel and really redeeming suffering and showing people who have uh, suffered a lot his grace and his compassion. Um, there are two things fundamentally that I believe we as a church need to really understand about the movement of people in order to deepen our, to deepen our discipleship and really befriend some of these refugees. The first is I really believe that we need to deepen our understanding of what the Bible talks about when it comes to the movement of people. Um, Matthew shared a little bit earlier about how we are followers of Jesus, and Jesus was a Middle Eastern refugee. If you know anything about his story, you know that he was a young single male, he was from a religious minority, um, that he was persecuted because of his nationality. Um, and so my question to all of us is, if Jesus were born today, he fits every single category of a person that we want to keep out of our country. So if Jesus were born today, would we welcome him into our communities? Would we even welcome him into our church? Um, it says in Acts 17, 23 to 24, that God created um, many nations out of one man, and he determined the places and the times that they should live. And he did this so that men could reach out to him and perhaps find him. What this verse teaches us is that migration is not an accident. In fact, I believe our communities are changing, the demographics of our country are changing because P God ultimately wants people to move into communities where they will eventually find him. Now, this is not a done deal, and this is not something that is um, eventually perhaps going to happen, but I believe this is fundamentally a choice that we as a church have to answer. Are we going to allow fear to dominate a response when it comes to the refugees? Are, are we going to lovingly um, reach out to our neighbors and believe in that encounter and in that relationship um, that we can have a transformative experience with refugees in our communities? Um, I've personally experienced this uh, living in Baltimore, which is just uh, an hour north of here, um, where there's numbers of refugees that are coming into um, Baltimore City. Now, one of the individuals um, that I've come to know is an Iranian refugee family, um, and they've actually were Baha'i in their faith, and they came into the United States several years ago. Now, I entered into this relationship um, thinking that, you know, I'm going to be giving to them and teaching them English and really spending my time with them. Um, but I actually re realized that me, more than me spending my time with this, this family, that I received more in that relationship than I could ever give. In fact, every single week they would invite me over for dinner, um, and I would eat some of the best food I've ever had in my life, some of the best Persian food I've ever had. Um, and it was really through that experience that I realized that there is something resilient about refugee stories in which I can learn about my own faith in God. In fact, the fact that these individuals were coming out of a place um, of Iran where they were persecuted because of their faith, going into Turkey and being resettled in the United States, um, I was actually able to share my faith with them. Um, and they started asking questions about, about the Bible and actually even came to church with me one Sunday. Um, and I was able to really um, demonstrate to them um, the reasons why I have hope in this world um, and for them to also have similar hope as well. Um, I believe we as a church not only need to deepen our discipleship and our theology of how God is really moving through the movement of people, um, but I also believe that it cannot happen outside the context of relationships. Um, as my friend James said earlier, we as a church are not going to be able to buy our ways out of, the, out of the refugee crisis, but what it will take is for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and responding to what God is doing through the movement of people. I believe that the refugee crisis, it's too big, and its impact on the church too significant for us to ignore what's happening in the world, but we have to realize that the refugee crisis is not confined to the borders of the Middle East 
or the borders of Africa or the borders of Asia, but fundamentally refugees are transforming communities right here in the United States of America. Um, one of the most dominant um, themes that I've heard in the refugee debate is the idea of fear and how fear has really fueled a response to the refugee crisis. And I believe there's a difference between rational fears and irrational fears. Irrational fears, I believe, um, funnel um, our desire to categorize people and to generalize people as refugees and perhaps even as terrorists. Um, but rational fears allow us to actually ask the right questions and as informed citizens, really being engaged in um, making sure that our government is doing its job. But if we allow fear to become our dominant response, I believe that we will become crippled to participating in the mission of God. Ultimately, our greatest enemy is not someone of a different religion, nor is it someone of a different nationality or ethnicity. I believe our greatest enemy is fear itself because fear can confine us from really understanding the work that God is doing through the, um, the movement of people. When we as a church choose to love and welcome the very people the world wants us to hate, that is when we will advance the kingdom of God. Now I wanna be very specific in pointing out three specific resources for all of us to really get involved in the refugee crisis. Um, the first is a book called Seeking Refuge, which my um, great colleagues and friends, uh, Matthew Soren, Stephen Bowman, the president of World Relief, and Isam Smear um, have written, who's a trauma counselor in our DuPage office. Um, this book really dives into the theology, the history, um, and also the psychology of what it means for, uh, for the refugee crisis um, to be impacting our communities and the church. Um, this is available, it was just released yesterday, and I would really encourage all of you to um, buy a, uh, a copy, either online or right here in the back of the church. Um, it really is a great resource that many churches and individuals have used to simulate conversations about the refugee crisis. Um, in addition to the church, we've also released a, a study guide um, in which we're actually challenging um, small groups of churches to actually come together to start talking about refugees. Uh, the second thing we've also um, are encouraging everyone to purchase um, or to, um, to engage in is really uh, with refugees locally here. Um, many of you may know that right here in Maryland, uh, we have a, a resettlement office that's led by James Sunday, who's here in the audience today. Uh, we are resettling um, about 100 uh, refugees per year right here in the state of Maryland. Um, there's other agencies as well that are resettling refugees, and we'd really encourage you to get involved with refugees that are being resettled right here into this local community. Um, our aim at World Belief is to pair every single refugee with a church family, uh, which means that you have an opportunity to create a good neighbor team in which you can pick up refugees at the airport, provide them with housing, um, and just really partner with them and be their friends as they transition to life here in the United States. Um, growing up in an immigrant home, I know how transformational relationships can be with the host community. Um, I know what it's like to actually feel like you're a minority where you're not really fitting in. And I think for the dozens of refugees that are coming into your community right here at this church, um, that this is an opportunity not just to give but to receive through the relationships that you can build with the others. Um, one tangible way um, that we've seen this is through um, the volunteers that are coming to our local offices and actually volunteering with refugees. And I just want to show you a short video of one individual and his story of actually working with uh, refugees um, in one of our offices. Looking back in the past 35 years of my life, I realized that I was focused on success at work and that left me very little quality time for serving God. The result was that, guess what? I made more money, but I didn't do ministry the way I knew I should be doing it, thinking that, oh, well, I'm young, I have more time. So 30s turns to 40s, 40s turns to 50s, and. Now I'm in my late 50s. Finally, I'm trying to flip it in the right direction, spending quality time doing God's work. The process of identifying which ministry my wife and I should select was very important to us, and we put a lot of thought into it. So when we discovered that over 600 refugees come to our city every year, we felt compelled to participate. So we have a family for you. They are from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And it's a family of seven. 
and they're all girls. Wow. So the DRC, it's been civil wars within the country, and that's why they've had to flee. The family arrives this Thursday night. Everything's going to be new to them, and they're really going to need a little bit of stability, and we all offer that. We've got an apartment, and we need to set it up. Would y'all be interested in being involved in sure. that process? Yeah. The way I'm wired, it's important to me to not be involved in huge events that are Billy Grahamish. I'm not made for the spotlight. I'm prone to pride, and that's what I have to fight. So put me in a spot that doesn't foster that, and that's where the Lord is putting us. When I read scripture, I see that it is incumbent upon all Christians to love God and to love others. Chumbo. Chumbo. Someone who shows up and didn't think he would ever get there, and he came here by the skin of his teeth, and he knows not what the future holds. That to me is a ripe situation to love others, and I want to be part of it. You want to see it? You want to go see? One bedroom here. And their bedroom is here. So mom and dad, you sleep here, and then someone else sleep here. I think the little one. The little one, yeah. Love is not all that complicated. It's actually quite simple. It sort of looks like making yourself very helpful to the people in your life. Some people need a soft word. Some people need a couch. Some people need a friend. Tell them that I'm sure they've had a long trip, but they're home, and they're glad that they're home. They're happy to know that they have people who really care about them and people want to help them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they think that they're going to keep seeing you in their lives. They want to see you again. Tell her yes, yes. When you're my age, you realize the weight of idolatry and realizing that other things have been more important and have taken the place of God. But at the same time, what I am encouraged about is the direction of my life. I will befriend this family. I will become aware of needs. I will pray for this family. Where that will lead, I'm not sure. Everybody's aiming at something. It's incumbent upon us to know what is that and what should it be. My aim in life is what God wants, what brings Him pleasure, what is His desire. Twilight Zone or what happened at the end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you guys so much uh, just for sharing. I feel really far from you right now, uh, but I'm just going to stay here, really, because it's not about me. You guys are the smart ones. You've written books and all kind of stuff. So uh, I'm just going to field questions. So we've had questions uh, from those of you here in the room and people who are watching live uh, online, questions that have come in through text messages and uh, some through cards. And so I'm getting fed uh, some of those questions here. And so uh, kind of in light, kind of picking up Jenny where you left off with some of the facts. Uh, one of the questions really to, to any of you that want to answer that we got is a very kind of practical logistical question. And it's what's the average timeline of a refugee from when they apply to when they are resettled? And then how long are they supported to being self-sufficient? 
Sure, so um, I think it's important to point out that most refugees are never gonna be resettled to a third country like the United States. In fact, um, the countries like Lebanon and Turkey and Jordan, for example, um, are gonna host the majority of refugees. And so the United States actually resettles less than half of 1% of the world's refugees. Um, so the past several years, we've accepted around 70,000 um, 70, refugees. And this year, we're actually on, um, on target to resettle the same. And so normally for any refugee that applies to come to this program, it takes about a year and a half to two years for them to even be processed. And so normally, actually in the 1970s, when the United States was accepting 200,000 refugees a year to come into the United States, we were processing them within months um, because we, we knew that the program was actually a life-saving program. Now, we still consider the refugee resettlement program to be a life-saving program, um, but it's actually taking a year and a half or to up to two years for them to even come into the United States. So it's not um, extremely quick. And the reason for that is because refugees all have to go through extensive security screenings. In fact, it's probably the most difficult way for anyone to actually immigrate into the United States is as a refugee. Um, and so it takes about a year and a half to two years on average for any refugee to come into the United States. Um, and so once they come into the United States, they actually are paired with an agency like World Relief. Uh, we're one of nine agencies that resettle refugees. Um, and we have about an eight month period in which we have to um, help set up that refugee in an apartment and get them partnered with local churches um, and help them find a job. And most refugees actually become self-sufficient pretty quickly once they get here. Um, but again, that's why the relationship with local churches are so important because even after eight months, um, they need friendships, they need relationships in their local communities to really make them feel welcome. And so I think the transition period is really, really short and refugees do really, really well. But I think when churches enter into that equation and really partner with us to actually resettle these refugees um, and build relationships with them, that's actually when we see a lot of the, the transformation happen. That's helpful. And, and I think uh, as people kind of think through some of the practicalities of it, th this is, um, even as we hear the stories that you guys have shared, the videos that we've watched that kind of stir our hearts, mm -hmm. it's a controversial issue. Um, and, uh, and so one of the questions that we got, um, uh, let's just dig in. Uh, the question was, uh, why is it that those who want to bring refugees here are called compassionate while those who want to make safe zones for them in the Middle East are labeled heartless and political. And so it's not so much of a question as it is a statement, <laughs> but uh, I do think it's important because I think a lot of people who do have some of the economic uh, concerns or uh, security concerns that you guys mentioned sometimes feel a little bit attacked mm. uh, when we, or at least it's interpreted that we pit compassion against these other issues. And so. How do you guys uh, tend to uh, help people kind of process that? I'll, I'll start. I would say I think, I think it's really important that we are really clear. Nobody thinks that the solution to this crisis is for everyone to come to the United States. I mean, we absolutely need to help encourage our government to figure out what are the best ways that we can leverage our influence to, first and foremost, seek peace in Syria and in, in Iraq and other areas where there's conflict but also to assist those who are in those neighboring countries. So I don't know what the best solution is, that's a little above my pay grade, but we absolutely need to be looking at that and helping the church in other parts of the world f figure out how they can influence that as well. We do believe that, uh, you know, as Jenny said, less than one half of 1% of the world's refugees get resettled to the United States in any given year. And that's a very small percentage, but it's for those particularly vulnerable cases who are most at risk, whether in that refugee camp or living in an urban environment, and we think that that's part of our, our national heritage in the United States to receive refugees. I mean, we have the Statue of Liberty saying, give me your tired, your poor, your, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Uh, we think that's part of our character, and we think it's a, a noble part of our character that is informed by, by biblical values of, of welcoming those who are vulnerable. Um, we don't think you need to choose between compassion and security. That process that Jenny mentioned that takes at least a year and a half in most cases, it's incredibly thorough. It involves the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State, Department of Defense, the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, um, you know, biometric scans and retina scans and all sorts of technology and in-person interviews. Uh, and I think one of the best evidences that that system is working is that with more than three million refugees resettled into the United States in the last 35 plus years, there's never been an act of terrorism perpetrated in the United States by someone who came in through that refugee resettlement program. 
Um, so we have a lot of confidence in that, in, in that process. It's appropriate to be asking those questions of, you know, the government has a role here of maintaining security, and we completely affirm that role. Even biblically, I think we see that in Romans chapter 13. But I want us to make sure we're focused on what is the church's role. And if these people are coming in, I want the church to be there at the airport welcoming them. Yeah. Um, I would also say that I think for this individual um, who asked this question, and, and there's a lot of people who are, who are, who are um, asking the right questions, um, I think we have a responsibility as citizens to ask questions over government, to, to, to question them, to write to them, to say, hey, are you doing your job as our government to keep us safe? Um, so I don't think there's any question about the fact that um, that is a role of government. Um, but I do think that um, I've been to Jordan, um, to Zaatari refugee camp, where there's over 80,000 Syrian refugees, um, to Lebanon and Turkey, where they're hosting, you know, 20, 25% of their, ref uh, their population is refugees, and they are literally at a breaking point. Um, and so when we even talking, talking about resettling refugees, it's not just a matter of, of um, you know, let's bring them all here because that's not going to solve the refugee crisis, but it really is um, a ma matter of national security where Jordan and Turkey and other countries are asking, you know, what can the, the global community do to re um, share responsibility for the fact that many refugees are fleeing into these communities? And so um, I think it's a matter of just um, alleviating some of the responsibility off some of the frontline states in Europe and in middle, the Middle East and in some African and Asian countries and to sh say that, you know, we as the United States have done this for decades. Uh, we know what churches um, and co local communities and businesses have actually um, um, been doing and actually partnering with us to resettle these refugees. And so I think as Matt was saying, I don't think it's an either or question. And I think we have to ask all the right questions. Um, but when we know that many of the refugees are in communities and in camps for 17 to 20 years, um, where they're not able to work or even go to school, and there's general f generational effects of that, I think we in the United States can do a small part in actually um, alleviating some of that responsibility, um, especially when we know that refugees have, have really transformed communities here, um, and churches have been a, a huge part of that. James, I know uh, we, were, we were talking before, before the event started, about kind of another sensitive angle just on the whole refugee conversation, and that's race. And so when we talk about just the, the fears that are involved uh, in just the whole refugee crisis, um, I've read things, had conversations on kind of different sides of it where some people say a lot of the fears are, uh, some of them are legitimate, they're economic, they're security issues, serious questions we should be asking, uh, but some of it is just these people are different. Uh, some of our uh, perceptions of them uh, may be informed uh, by, uh, from sources that aren't necessarily reliable or present uh, the, the most accurate picture. Uh, and so we were kind of talking a little bit about that. So just in your experience interacting with people, particularly in the church, uh, is that something that you see play a part? Um, and if so, like how do you encourage Christians to kind of press through that uh, to, to really reflect kind of what we understand the gospel to be. Yeah, maybe what I'll do is I'll give a, a theological point of view, and then maybe Matt and Jenny can add some more pragmatics to it. I think there is um, something very prevalent in the dialogue, both inside the church and outside the church, that has uh, what many people would call uh, underlying prejudice uh, in it. Uh, but I think, and I'll use this story to illustrate this, I think there's something deeper uh, than that. Uh, it's very easy to go around saying, well, you don't like somebody, so you're a racist. I think that's reductionist. Uh, Tim Keller tells the story of going, and it's a famous story now, he tells it often, of going to speak to a group of pastors. His wife went on the trip with him, uh, and that morning in the hotel room, while they were getting ready, she asked a rather benign question, and he snapped at her and got into a little marital tiff, whatever. Uh, he went to that group of pastors and told the story and said, yes, it was wrong, that I did that, but there was something underneath of it. There was a sin underneath of the sin. And what he said was, I was so afraid about impressing you um, that I got nervous. I was prideful because I wanted you to think highly of me uh, that I snapped at her this morning. Um, yes, both were wrong, but there was a sin underneath of the sin. I think that's true when it comes to the refugee crisis or issues of race and ethnicity in general. Um, if you look at a narrative of scripture, you can make a fairly strong case 
uh, that the quest for power and pride might be the sin underneath the sin when it comes to these issues. If you look at uh, the first sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, yes, uh, Eve ate the fruit that the serpent tempted her with, uh, but why did she do it? Uh, because eating the fruit would give her the knowledge of good and evil, and she did that so she could become like God. Uh, it was a pride thing. It was a power thing. If you look at the story of Cain and Abel, um, God favored one of the sacrifices more than the other, uh, so there was retaliation and murder. Um, Pride and the quest for power kind of permeates lots of these conversations. If you look at the first several books of the Bible, uh, going up to the Tower of Babel, God kind of gives one command over and over and over again uh, to people, and that's uh, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Um, God wanted there to be rich diversity um, um, and flourishing for people, but what did we as humanity do? We got together in a field and we said, let's build a tower and do what? Make a name for ourselves. Uh, that's the pride issue again. And God's punishment for that was that they weren't able to then communicate. They couldn't speak the same language. And I think some of that punishment we still feel today. Um, but fast forward, you have to remember that God wanted them uh, to be diverse. He wanted them to go out and make different cultures, make cities, become farmers. Uh, you fast forward to the end of the scriptures to Revelation and you see something really unique happening you see uh, this wonderful picture of heaven in which people from every tribe, nation, and family are gathered together. And they're not like they were in the story of Babel, making a name for themselves. They're making the name of God great. Uh, they're singing praises to God. They have uh, two things. They have unity. They're singing the same exact song, but at the same time, they have uniqueness. Uh, they are representatives of their ethnic groups, of their racial groups. Um, I think it's really interesting that uh, God, first of all, punishes people uh, by making it so they can't communicate together. But at the same time, the whole trend of scripture, the whole trend of mission of reaching lost people is so that we get to that point at the end of time where there's people from all these different nations uh, with uniqueness and unity, worshiping God instead of making a name for ourselves. If you look at the book of Galatians, when it talks about baptism, the idea of dying to yourself and when you go under the water, raising uh, to new life in Christ, uh, it says basically when people go into the water, there's separation between Jew and Greek, different cultural groups, slave and free, different economic groups, and male and female, different gender groups. When you go into the water, when you come out of the water, uh, those things don't matter as much anymore because at that point then you are in Christ. Yes, you are still Jew or Greek, you are slave or free, you are male, male or female, uh, but you're in Christ and that identity as a follower of Jesus uh, takes precedent over your other identities. So I think, Mike, in the refugee crisis, you do see prejudice. You see people who are afraid of people from a different group. Uh, they see the stereotype of uh, a jihadist and they think, oh my goodness, I can't do anything with a person that's Arab. Uh, they, they spread that across that whole group of people. Um, but I think that underneath of that are uh, differences in racism. I think it's, it's pride and I think it's quest for power. We are better. Um, uh, we view ourselves as over and against others. Uh, and I think that is what's more at play than just straight up racism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. There's lots of different things. You could spend a whole night like this talking about that. I mean, that. I could tell you went to school to study it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure, absolutely, yeah. Jenny and Matt, practical yeah. applications yeah. of that? Well, I think um, whenever there's something that makes us feel uncomfortable, we're really quick to categorize and generalize and label those things. And I feel like race is one of the social constructs which we've used as society going back centuries to categorize and label individuals into, ca um, into generalities so that it can make us feel comfortable. Um, I know being an a ethnic minority and a woman um, in the United States of America, um, what, it, what um, it feels like to experience racism, and I felt that throughout my entire life, always trying to fit in and wondering whether or not I ever could. Um, and I think, especially for the American church, it has to go deeper. Um, where we have to say, what does the Bible say about individuals who are made in the image of God? And how are we in our sin using race as a social construct to keep ourselves comfortable and creating a distance between us and them? And I think race is a, a category in which we can other people. Um, but I also think religion is another category we've seen in the refugee crisis where we're othering other people, um, people as well. Um, and I think especially even more than race, I think 
Um, a lot of Christians are talking about Muslims as, as individuals because they share a different religion than us um, as either our enemy or as someone that we shouldn't befriend or as even as terrorists very generally. Um, and so I think anytime we categorize and generalize individuals into um, something that makes us feel comfortable, um, then I think it lessens our ability um, to not just show empathy, but to really build relationships with those individuals. And so I think we really need to overcome not just race, but religion as, um, as general categories and really start to under understand individual stories um, and relationships. Man, I was gonna ask you this, you wrote this book, you co-wrote this book, right? And, and I read it and it made me s sound much smarter to my wife, uh, <laughs> at least for one evening. Um, uh, but in it, uh, on page 46, you said this, and, and then I want to end with just two real practical questions. You uh, mentioned in here in the book, uh, uh, um, theologian Juan Martinez it says, notes that immigrants, uh, and I don't know if it was you that wrote this line or who wrote it, but it's in the book that you co-wrote, so I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, immigrants are not merely objects of mission, but also agents of mission. And I wondered if you could just unpack that a little bit and help us understand why that was so important to include in the book. Yeah, I think, it, I think we should see the arrival of refugees as a mission on our doorstep, but I think we should, with the caveat that A, you know, probably about half of them are already some sort of Christian, and some of them, some of them may be sort of nominal, but most of them it's very genuine. Um, so don't be surprised when you go share the gospel with someone if they share it right back at you. And frankly, in some ways that we might need to hear as American Christians by people, I mean, I have Karen Burmese neighbors who come to my door to tell me about Jesus. And I have some things to learn about following Jesus from people who've been forced out into a jungle um, because they insisted on following Jesus. But even those who are not yet followers of Jesus when they arrive here might become them, might start following Jesus, and might be the most effective evangelists to those in their own community or beyond than we can imagine. And, you know, the Syrian refugee, the Syrian Muslim refugee arriving today might be the next Billy Graham. Um, we don't know what God will do. Nobody saw, thought the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, you know, the ISIS of his day, persecuting Christians, would be the author of most of the New Testament. And, you know, like, we shouldn't limit what God could do yeah. through someone's work. And I think, of course, we want people to know Jesus, but also not to underestimate how God might use them in fulfilling his mission as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think some people may, may say, all right, this is all, this is all great. I mean, this is nice. Uh, but, like, bottom line, right, can we afford refugees? Just, just bottom line. So I want to have that question as well as just the practical question of uh, somebody sent in, I would like to do more with refugees through my church. Uh, how do you recommend uh, th that I do this? So I want to end with those two. Just flat out, can we, can we afford it? I th the, the underlying presumption there is that this is a cost. Um, it, there are some costs related to resettling refugees, but there also are contributions, there are benefits. In fact, if you look at immigration overall, and there's been more research in terms of the discipline of economics on immigration broadly than just on refugees, but almost every economist will affirm for you that the Im net economic impact of immigration on the United States is significantly positive. Um, for a bunch of reasons. Those people become taxpayers, they become consumers. I mean, 13% of this country is foreign-born, and it's probably fair to presume that they're consuming 13% of the hamburgers and 13% of the iPhones and 13% of the cars and paying 13% of the rent. That all feeds back into a growing economy. Um, and Im immigrants are also uniquely entrepreneurial, and we see that particularly with refugees. Actually, there's a study out of um, Columbus, Ohio, that found that refugees were twice as likely as U.S. citizens to start new businesses, small businesses. Um, so there's a lot of ways that refugees contribute. There are some costs up front um, with refugees that are actually unique from other immigrants because they receive some assistance, they're eligible for certain public benefits. Um, but there's a study out of Utica, New York that found, you know, if you look at the long term, you look at refugees over time, the net economic impact of them coming to a community is significantly positive. Sure, the, it's, it's weighted more towards costs the first few years, but then it becomes more benefits than costs. And because these people will presumably spend the rest of their lives here, um, that adds up over time. And um, so there's a lot of opportunities for our economy, actually, from receiving refugees. And that, not just for the United States. You know, if you look at a country like Germany, Germany has been very, very generous in some ways in receiving a huge number of Syrian asylum seekers. I mean, we've received somewhere around 7,000 Syrian refugees total since the war began in 2011. Um, Germany has, has said they'd take 800,000, and they nearly met that last year. Part of that is humanitarian concern. 
part of it is also them looking at the fact that they have a very low birth rate in Germany, and they will have a sh they have a shrinking population, which is really a problem for a growing economy if they don't have more people coming in. So it's also an economic calculation, and um, ultimately is a long-term economic benefit. I think that if I can just. Um, ask, I mean, the question was, can we afford to rece receive refugees? And I would actually ask the question, can we afford not to receive these refugees as a church? I think people are looking at the brokenness and the suffering and the conflict and looking for an answer, and I think the church has the answer. And I think if we sit on the sidelines of what is the greatest humanitarian crisis in our generation, um, the church is going to have missed an incredible opportunity to actually demonstrate what the gospel is and what we stand for as a church. So I think the question is, can we afford not to actually engage in this? James, I'm going to let you have the, the last word, man. You, you work with a lot of churches. Somebody asked, I want to get more involved uh, with refugee ministry through my church. How do I do it? I think the first thing that people need to do uh, when they want to dive in with their church is help people become educated. Uh, host a forum like this one, uh, get copies of the book. We have a free small group study along with that. Uh, really help people understand uh, who and what refugees are and what they're facing, uh, but also help them understand what the scriptures say. Like we said in the beginning, this is a long-term crisis. Um, and people need to have a deep rooting in the heart of God for it uh, if they're really going to make a difference. So host some kind of educational event, get your church staff, your leaders engaged, and then I would say find small ways to start. Uh, don't set out saying we're going to host 30 refugees in the first year. Maybe say, hey, we're going to collect welcome kits. We're going to get apartments set up uh, for three refugee families this year and get Sunday school classes, small groups, families, collecting items, helping to set up an apartment. It's a really great way to make a tangible difference. And then as you do that, as people are starting to buy into the idea, as you're leading people forward in this, as you see God start to work, then maybe form a good neighbor team. Take a small group or a Sunday school class and say, hey, we're going to work with that family from Congo or from Burma or from Iraq or Syria. Uh, and we're going to surround them and we're going to uh, do life with them for six to 12 months. And we're going to really help them make a, a fruitful transition to the U.S. I think if you do those, those few things, really educate, dive deep with people, uh, give them some on-ramps, welcome kits, setting up apartments, uh, and then uh, uh, joining with the family, helping them to adjust to the U.S., I think you'd be off to a really good start. And I honestly think any church in America, whether you're 30 people uh, in a storefront or 30,000 people in a stadium, can do all three of those things. Uh, obviously to different scale, and at that point, then you're off to the races. The sky's the limit, uh, and you can do a whole lot of creative stuff. Thank you, guys. Hey, before we uh, <clears throat> end, I want to pray for us, but I thought, uh, kind of, we, we've talked about a lot of the theory, a lot of the kind of practical considerations and issues, but uh, just to, in addition to the videos that we've watched, kind of bring it home a little bit, especially for those of you who live here uh, in Montgomery County, uh, and especially those of you who are part of our church uh, here. Um, I want to invite uh, Jordan Henshaw to come up, and as he's coming up, let's thank our guests for speaking today. You guys can, can grab your seats. And uh, uh, this is Jordan. Everybody say, hey, Jordan. Those of you watching online, I didn't Hello. hear you. Yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Uh, you're overachiever. All right. Uh, hey, this is Jordan, man. I've known Jordan for uh, several years now, and he's uh, been a part of our church for a while and has really uh, personally, he and his, his uh, new wife, uh, and even uh, prior to them being married, were just actively involved in serving local refugees here uh, in Montgomery County uh, um, and, and more, even more specifically in Prince George's County, uh, which we'll talk about. So, uh, Jordan, I wanted you to just take a couple of minutes as we prepare to close because I want people to think about how they might really pray about uh, engaging uh, uh, local, local refugees here. So just talk about how you got involved in it, what you guys have been doing, and uh, any ways that you want to encourage uh, folks. Um, so uh, my now wife and I uh, got involved in the ministry just honestly by sitting down with uh, Philippe Prosper, some of you know him, and he had already set out to start some sort of ministry for refugees. Um, so really, it was Philippe who kind of hooked us in, and we just uh, hosted a dinner. Um, we met with uh, um, some people from the International Rescue Committee, and they said one of the best ways to get started is to host a dinner. So we hosted a dinner, brought some people over, and it just we formed relationships with these people, and we just kept helping. Um, 
and over time it's you know looked different we've done different things um, and one story comes to mind one that was sort of triggered by uh, some of the videos we were actually watching there's one person my wife and I have worked with specifically um, continually over the years um, and he had to he's a single father and um, had two kids and he, he couldn't get a job and take care of the kids at the same time and so we helped him um, and really actually he found this place he found a place where he could send his kids to get schooling away from home so that he could get a job um, and so we helped take his kids there and uh, I just remember when we dropped those kids off they had become maybe not necessarily like my own kids. I don't have kids, so I don't know what that's like. Um, but uh, they'd become friends, uh, you know, people I loved. And I remember walking away uh, from there as we left them uh, crying because it was just sad to see them leave, sad to see uh, the father separated from his kids in order to be able to have a better life. Um, and so uh, that's one example. We have other examples. We've had many people from the church help. Um, we've done things like hand out clothes in a community where many live. Um, we've had other dinners and hosted people. And uh, there are many different uh, ways to just kind of get started. And then, you know, it really it's all about building those relationships. And once you start building those relationships, at least for myself and my wife, it, it's really just natural to help out. Um, these are people that you care about and you love and you, you want to see them do well. Um, did I answer all your questions? You answered it, man. <laughs> yeah, let's thank Jordan. Thank you, man, for sharing. So I wanted to have, have Jordan share as we close because I think a lot of times when we uh, sit in events like this and we hear uh, so many things that are either challenging or so many things that are really inspiring, and we kind of feel the pressure of jumping from zero to 60. Uh, and Jordan's story is just really, really normal and just really, really basic. He just, they just got involved. He and Lindsay just hosted a dinner and started building relationships. And the need came up and they said, all right, we'll drive your kids here. Oh, you want to come visit church? We'll drive you to church. We'll get some other people. Oh, your friends want to come to church? We'll get some other people from the church to, to give them a ride on, on Sundays. It was just really basic relational uh, things. And so uh, what I really want to challenge uh, you with, specifically those of you who are part of our church, is really to just pray over the next week. Specifically pray. Uh, don't do anything yet. Just pray and say, God, how do you want me to apply what I've learned? How do you want us as a church to apply what we've learned just over the next week. And after that week, if there's things that start kind of uh, bubbling up in your heart, email me and let's just see what the Lord has from there. If you're not a part of our church and you are a part of a church, I'd encourage you to, to do that same thing and go back to your church uh, and have that conversation. And then for those of you who are here and not a part of a church at all, uh, this is a great one. And so if you want to come back, uh, come, come visit us. But we're so, uh, so glad uh, that, that you're here. Um, uh, I see uh, Eric, who's out here, uh, with another just inspiring story. As a matter of fact, the same community that Jordan and Lindsay have been serving in, he and his wife decided to relocate and move into that uh, apartment complex. And they have some wild stories, but man, they've been so faithfully serving uh, in that community and really living out Philippians chapter 2, the gospel, uh, that Jesus relocated and came into our neighborhood and lived our experience uh, with us in order to reach us, and they've been doing that. And so just pray, ask the Lord, how does he want you uh, to, to respond? Uh, before we pray, a couple of things for those of you who are here. Uh, there's resources out in the lobby, uh, and then our speakers uh, um, from the evening will be out there as well if you have other questions or anything. If you want to purchase the book, Seeking Refuge, it's available out there and a bunch of other uh, resources for you to be able to use. Uh, so let me pray for us, and then we'll get out of here. Father, thank you so much for everything that we've heard. I think about uh, James uh, chapter 1, Lord. Your word says that if anyone lacks wisdom to ask you, God, and you give it generously, uh, but Father, not if we're double-minded, God. Lord, not if we are asking for your wisdom and at the same time clinging to our own will. And so, Lord, I pray that first and foremost, God, before we try to rush out and do anything, Lord, I pray that we would kind of figuratively open our hands and open our hearts and say, God, whatever you want me to do, 
wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to give, uh, God, I will, I will. And Lord, I pray that in that, I know, God, that in that, you are faithful to your promise. You will give us wisdom. You will give us guidance. You will enable us, God, to do the good works that you have prepared in advance for us to do. And so, Lord, make us salt. Make us a light uh, shining uh, to the world, uh, a a picture, an image of what uh, you are like. Our gracious God, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight.